John, the big get is MLB commissioner Rob Manfred. And Andrew, we have Sean McManus retiring from CBS Sports. We're talking about Taylor Swift again. Plus, everybody wants to cover sports media, even Oregon coach Dan Lanning. Yeah, I mean, I don't know Skip at all. Um, I've never had a conversation with him. Um, it, I, I've watched him enough to know how often he gets it wrong. So, I mean, that sounds about right. <laughs> And we're back. The Martian and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. In a bit, we'll have the big get, Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, uh, as the regular season comes to a close and the playoffs are upon us. But let's go. Who's up? Who's down? Let's start with the who's up, who's down. You broke the story on Tuesday, Andrew. Uh, who's your who's up? You're giving it away for me. Uh, my who's up? <laughs> is David Burson. Sean McManus, uh, after a legendary career, is going to retire after the Super Bowl and the Masters next year. And Burson is going to be the head of CBS Sports. The succession plan has been in place for a long time. He's been there 13 years, a decade as CBS as sports president. Now he'll take the reins. He's worked hand in hand with McManus, who we're going to get into uh, his legacy uh, as our number one topic today. Uh, but a big promotion. Um, and this is, you know, for people who watch sports, these type of decisions and the likes of the people who are at the top of these uh, divisions uh, really make a, a difference. Uh, and so Burson gets a huge position and a huge promotion. Well, my who's up is along the same veins, Andrew. You don't generally see these types of executive moves this hap happening this quickly. I mean, Sean McManus was at CBS for 27 years. My who's up is Rick Cordella, who on Friday was named the, the head of NBC Sports. It was an internal hire by Mark Lazarus. He talked to a couple of people outside of uh, of, of NBC. Uh, Rick Cordella, very well liked by the rank and file at NBC. A lot of them were really pushing for him to, to be named uh, the head of NBC Sports. And like you said, it's going from Pete Bavacqua to Rick Cordella I don't expect there to be a lot of changes because they have experienced executives overseeing marketing and communications and programming and production. But, you know, it will be interesting to see how Cordella uh, puts his stamp on NBC Sports. Cordella comes from Peacock. He comes from the digital uh, realm. And so his taking over the head of NBC Sports, certainly you, you would think is going to um, hurry that along. I mean, one thing I've heard is they're going to make a big run to have more Providence College basketball games. Um, as <laughs> Rick Cordella's fun fact, he was on the Elite Eight team in 1997. God Sham God was on that team, the uh, the legendary God Sham God. Austin Crozier, who was in the NBA, was yep. on that Pete team. Gillen was the coach. I think that I played as many minutes in that uh, NCAA tournament as Rick Cordella, though, Andrew. He didn't get a lot of time, but it's still impressive to, to be on the Providence <laughs> team that went uh, far in the NCAA tournament. All right, my who's down, ESPN's NFL Monday night football doubleheaders. Not the extra games. The extra games are tremendous. But I think the NFL has sort of, I know they're experimenting. That's their big thing. But I don't like the two games going at once. I think they should do um, one game and then the next game um, like they did, you know, originally when they used to have those opening night double headers. And I don't see why you couldn't have a West Coast game. Now, personally, I might not be staying up that late. And maybe that's the reason why I got a feeling maybe they really want to be in that uh, 8 to 1130 window uh, on the East Coast. Uh, but I will say, I kind of find it's like having two quarterbacks. Uh, you have no quarterbacks, you know, generally speaking. Now, if it's Steve Young and Joe Montana, then you do have two quarterbacks. But but they, these games so far, so far, have not been Steve Young and Joe Montana type games. I feel like they need to kind of, they love experimenting the NFL, because this is not an ESPN thing. This is more the Howard Katzes of the world and the NFL uh, TV executives who decide all this and the schedule makers. I don't really think that having the two games uh, at once works. My who's down, Andrew, uh, David Preschlack, who runs Diamond Sports. And I'm talking about the regional sports networks and Valley Sports again, because this is a critically important week for the RSNs over there. First of all, their uh, deal with Comcast is up 
this week at the at the end of this week and so they have to negotiate that that's going to be a tough negotiation comcast over the past several years has a history of just doing the deals and passing on increases to their customers comcast has its own rsns and so it's tough for comcast to make a stand against uh against diamond uh i don't know how this is going to play out i suspect comcast is going to get the deal done which could be good however next month direct tv is up and then charter remember charter uh dropped uh dropped uh, all the disney networks and espn they're up early next year not only that andrew but the creditors they have a hearing with the bankruptcy court uh later this week to determine sort of how they go forward and all these deals all these distribution deals with the comcast and direct tv and and uh and charter that's all going to matter as they go to the to the court. So this is a really big defining week going forward for uh, Diamond Sports. Yeah, we'll try to get into that when we talk to Rob Manfred uh, in a little bit. Uh, obviously, getting into the local rights uh, situation with baseball uh, and where they're going from there. Right, let's move to the topics. Uh, topic number one, I think, has to be Sean McManus retiring uh, after 27 years leading CBS Sports. I think when you look at the most pinnacle executives uh, in TV history, uh, he has to be in there uh, because of what happened in 1998. He became the head of CBS Sports in 1996, and then he was instrumental in leading uh, CBS, uh, regaining the NFL. If you look at the history of TV over the last 30 to 40 years, the networks that did not have the NFL when they plummeted in the ratings, going down to last place usually, uh, and he got the NFL back. He's maintained that relationship, and it's the driving force of CBS and then now Paramount Plus. Just for that move, I mean, there are a lot of others, but just for that move, that's the one that you know where you can David Burston. When I talked to him the other day, that's where you can call him a legend uh, because of that move. Now, not as flashy as a Dick Ebersol, uh, but that. He was the one who got that done. Um, and when you look at the history of sports television, uh, that was monumental. Yeah. And I, I want to go back to the 1990s. And, you know, when, when he did that deal and actually when they hired Sean McMahon as CBS Sports was in disarray. I mean, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he saved CBS Sports. They had lost baseball. Uh, they were in the process. They had a, a couple of winter of Olympics and they were in mm. the process of, of, of losing that. They had lost the NFL. Uh, they they were really struggling moving forward. And the one thing that that uh, uh, Sean McManus is known for, uh, best known for, is these deep, long-standing relationships. How long has uh, CBS had the Masters? That goes back to I think the you know uh, decades the 19, and decades, like yeah, 50 decades, plus nineteen fifties. Other than that, that little uh, four-year blip where they didn't have the NFL. That's a relationship that goes back a, a long time. The relationship with the PGA Tour, these are all decade-long relationships. Even the NCAA tournament, this is that that's a relationship that they have that goes back a, a long time. So Sean, when he gets in there, uh, I can't think of an executive that I have covered that's better liked than Sean McManus. He's just he, he has a, a knack of developing relationships. Fun fact about Sean McManus that uh, you know and a lot of people know: his father. Are you joking? Uh, Jim. Yeah, Jim McKay. Uh, Jim McKay. Like I, I don't know if all our listeners know that Jim. No, McKay's all our legendary. listeners know, but I hope I do. No, oh, of course you knew. I, I, I wouldn't have asked you if I didn't, I didn't know. I probably, we don't. How many shows have we done? All right, maybe by the two hundred show, I'll get that. I thought it was like okay, like you're gonna pause and say it, like you know, like you're like. No, I was waiting me. for you to. I'm used I mean, to last week I asked you about me. Howard. Last week I asked you about Howard Schnellenberger being the U of M coach. I feel like that's a question. Like, all right, maybe he'll know what you did know. To your credit, maybe you won't know. I mean, I think if you who cover forget, this, who could forget Howard Schnellenberger's big mustache? I mean, come exactly. on, exactly. But if you cover this industry for a long time or even for a minute, you got to know that uh, Sean McMahon is his father, is Jim McKay. I mean, legendary uh, sportscaster. Uh, so yes, I. Thank you. I got that one. Do I, I don't think I even get a point for that little quiz question. <laughs> I, I'm just so used to you interrupting me, Andrew, that I just was like, I was waiting for you to get in there. I, it's and I was you. holding back. I was holding back. I'm like, <laughs> I oh, know. I gotta, Your wait, restraint is admirable. Gun. Please, can I finish? Okay, I'm finished. But I also want to talk about, a little bit about uh, David Burson, who um, uh, he formerly of, of ESPN hired, I, I think, 13 years ago 
by CBS. And he, and really when he was hired by CBS, he was the president in, in waiting or the, the, the next leader of CBS sports. Uh, and he worked at Sean McManus's side for 13 years. And when it was announced that Sean McManus was stepping down after the masters, there was, there was nobody else who possibly would be replacing McManus other than Burson. And so if people are looking at changes to expect coming to CBS sports, Certainly, Burson's going to put his stamp on on it. Uh, he's a different person than Sean, but uh, by and large, I expect it to be pretty similar to the way it is right now. Yeah, but they are in a kind of a little bit of a transition stage when you look at it with Burson into the top position, replacing McManus after the Masters, and then March Madness. Uh, you know, changing the guard there in terms of uh, Ian Eagle will be the lead play by play voice, uh, replacing Jim Nance. So you just kind of see a generational. Thing. Not that, you know, Burson and Eagle are in their 50s, so like they've been around a long time and established and important in this business, uh, but, you know, they're kind of just a changing of where CBS is and where they're going, uh, but I agree. I think largely, you know, they've been working hand in hand, so you, you, you might not see a uh, monumental change, and they're pretty locked in with the NFL, golf, including the Masters, uh, March Madness, the Big Ten, and then... Uh, it's on CBS, but also Paramount Plus, uh, the Champions League, which is the biggest club tournament uh, in the world. Their deals are pretty much um, locked in for a while, and I, I don't think they're going to deviate too much from that. Like, I don't, they could they get involved in the NBA? I don't think it's impossible, but probably very, I think, unlikely. Yeah, and these are all deals, by the way. It's not like a David Burson's coming in brand new at these. These are all deals that David was sitting at the table helping to yep. negotiate as well. So it's it should, I again, I don't. There are lots of changes in the business that are going to happen anyway, as as we've been talking about for two years on this pod. I don't expect really big changes with David becoming uh, the, the new president CEO over there. All right. We have topic two, and nobody's not going to accuse us of not playing the hits. <laughs> I'm reading here on the rundown. I think you put this on here, John. NFL and Taylor Swift. We God. have daughters. We have daughters, Andrew. We I saw Taylor Swift. I saw Taylor Swift over the summer at the Meadowlands. It was tremendous. I mean, I, I would say I, I'm not like I wouldn't go again. I mean, it was great. I mean, I, I just happenstance that I ended up going, which is like a shame because people would give off, like cut their left arm off for it to go. So I kind of felt guilty that way. But she's a tremendous performer. My social feed, as yours is, is dominated now by pictures and video of Taylor Swift at the Chiefs game, watching uh, watching Kelsey uh, score a touchdown and cheering, uh, you know, next to uh, next to uh, uh, Kelsey's mom. Um, a lot of I I've just seen a lot of people wonder about uh, whether or not bringing this whole generation of Swifties into the NFL is going to do anything to boost the Chiefs or do anything to boost uh, TV ratings. I talked to several people, uh, s several people at the networks, uh, the chiefs already where you have the Cowboys and the chiefs. They're, they're, they're one of one of top two teams in terms of, uh, generating ratings, uh, with Patrick Mahomes and with the stars. I mean, there's the defending Super Bowl champions and people don't think with the regular season that there's going to be a big difference with uh, the, the dating potential dating. They have not confirmed that. I mean, it's everywhere. Nobody's confirmed it. Page six, all over at New York post. I, the today show had a story this morning, long story. I, I, nobody's confirmed this. Um, so, you know, you can get on that. If you want to break that story that they're not dating, could be a big <laughs> publicity stunt. Um, I don't know how you date though. If you're like that famous, I mean, well, I don't you know. know. There was a report that I don't even know if it's accurate that like they bought out a restaurant that, First, that I first saw that she did, then I saw that he did, that they paid for everyone, told them to get out, you know, they want to have a date. Um, I, I think it's very hard. It's hard to date to get, you know, people, you know, to get along first off and to have the romance, but to have all this other stuff, I think would make it quite difficult. John, right now, if you're, if you're listening and not watching on YouTube, he's looking up something. What are you looking up? No, you know what? We just got uh, Krista Myers, who is our uh, ace uh, social media maven. Okay. Uh, she believes it's a publicity stunt. Who? Krista Myers. Yeah, Kr Krista so sent, a, married she, she sent a message to us. That was what I was looking at, saying that he looks so uncomfortable in that video in the locker room. And she's a social media maven. Like she's, so if she she's says that, I will know. say, I agree with Krista in that the video was shot by Jared Payton 
Walter Payton's son, who was a good, you know, played college football as well, I think in Miami. Um, but shot, it was just, it's a weird, cool, you know, thing to happen because it was in, uh, I guess it was in Kansas City, but he must have been there with the uh, Bears. He shot that. I agree. The body language did not suggest that they've gone out. Like you, you would think if you're going out, you'd hold hands there. Can I uh, tell a quick story? I did a profile on Michael Eisner, okay. who uh, used to run Disney, and uh, he, he was the owner of the Angels when the Angels won the World Series. And he was telling a story about the night that the Angels won the World Series. It was in, in Anaheim, and there's video of John Travolta in his box cheering like a madman. And he said John Travolta knew nothing about baseball. He was not a baseball fan. He was not an Angels fan, but he is an actor. And when when Eisner said like, "Hey, we want you to sit in the seats and like, uh, and and uh, you know, b- be a fan," he he went into full acting mode. And all of a sudden, like, was you know, they would get in, the Angels would get in out, and he'd jump up and cheer and high five people. And you know, I'm just I'm just putting that out there. It, 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 all right, it so looked, you're saying they might be acting jobs. All yeah. right, well, listen, there's a lot of. Uh... Taylor Swift, uh, there's places to look to find out if they're really dating or not. We have spent this. five minutes more on Taylor Swift than I ever thought we would have. In terms of popularity, I'm going to move up a topic. I'm making an editorial decision here. Um, <laughs> moving to topic four to topic three, Deion Sanders, who has captivated uh, college football. We heard from Dan Lanning at the opening. He was ripping on Skip Bayless, but his Oregon team, uh, they crushed Colorado last weekend, but Dion has had a major impact uh, on TV, which, uh, you know, a year earlier, if he'd come a year earlier, maybe the Pac-12 still is in existence and they kept Colorado because it, it really is incredible what the uh, what he's done with the ratings. No, it's a perfect se- September story. Uh, and e- even in a blowout loss uh, to Oregon on Saturday, that was the most watched college football game, uh, a- according to, to, to Nielsen numbers just edging out that thrilling Notre Dame Ohio State game in prime time on on uh, NBC. And so uh, as we get into October, expect and especially if Colorado loses to USC uh, this weekend, a big if, but you know if that happens, expect the networks to sort of, sort of start to retrench a little bit from Colorado. It was a great uh, September story, but now we're going to be focused a little bit more on the playoffs. And on 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 some of those teams jockeying for that for that position, it'll still be a, a ratings driver. It'll still be a a, a a team that networks will want to have. But I don't think that you'll see Colorado in a, a lot of these like prime time slots anymore. All right, Rob Manford. In a moment, let's final topic before we get to the commissioner. Uh, Apple TV Plus, uh, GQ had a story on Eddie Q. I think the headline was something to the effect of like how they're going to change sports. Um, very positive story. Uh, John, give me you. I didn't really hear. There's no buzz on that story for me, at least. The only way I knew about it is you you uh, texted it to me and then I read it. And Eddie Q did have a couple of quotes in there. One about with Manford about uh, he told Rob Manford they should use robots uh, for instead of umpires. Um, what was your take on it? Give me your synopsis because uh, we don't hear from Apple that often. I was fascinated by it because Apple doesn't let reporters inside uh, 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 Apple at all. Apple, they're not a disruptive force yet, but they have the potential to be a totally disruptive force that's right now sort of sitting on the sidelines of sports. But like if you listen to what Eddie Q said and you read some of those quotes, they're clearly biding their time until they can come in and, and shake some things up. I have three takeaways from this. One is Eddie Q is a sports nut. I mean, we already know he's a, has a season tickets to the Warriors. This has his, he has nine TVs that he watches sports on a big Duke fan. I mean, that's, that sort of really came uh, to the fore. Number two, Apple is interested in sports, but they're interested in sports on, on their own terms, not sort of the existing terms. So when they were negotiating for Sunday ticket, they wanted to do things that the NFL didn't w- wasn't uh, willing to allow, and so like they they're they're waiting to bide their time until you know they they are, are able to do that. And number three, Apple just they have these bananas ideas about how to bring tech into the game. I mean that you you mentioned the robot umpires in, in baseball, which people have sort of talked about, 
but there's not an understanding about working with unions or he, I think he thinks that Manfred can just with a uh, stroke of his pen sort of make that happen. So it, it's it's just this idea that when Eddie Q and when Apple look at sports, they're not looking at sports as it is. They're looking to be a totally disruptive force in sports, which is what they've done with, with MLS. I mean, that messy contract, you wouldn't see any broadcast network do a contract with a single player like like Apple did with Messi. It's just totally different and outside the box. Yeah, a couple of things. Number one, I've talked about the idea of them either having a stake in ESPN or buying ESPN. To me, when they do that, if they do that, not I shouldn't say when, if they do that, um, then they'll really be serious uh, about sports. And I think it makes some sense, even though they don't usually buy anything and they might not be as interested in that. Uh, that's number one. Number two, if you're going to revolutionize sports, at least in the near term, probably should have done an NFL deal. You can't revolutionize sports on television and what we think of that without the NFL, in my opinion. Maybe they'll do an NBA deal. I will say he did not seem that bullish in those quotes and kind of what we've heard and talked about here about just doing one game a week. Uh, that didn't sound like what he wants to do. He wants to own everything. And I think the one thing is, like I've said before, if it was an even playing field and we started at zero, then what Apple wants to do sounds great. The problem is these leagues still make so much money in doing these deals. The networks and other platforms like Amazon and Google have come in and spent huge money. Uh, Apple has not done that yet. Um, it's a basically a rev sharing deal um, with uh, MLS. I mean, there's some money guaranteed, of course. Uh, and so I don't know how they move that mountain uh in the near term right maybe eventually maybe you're talking 15 years down the road but like in the next five years i mean the nfl is not even going to be up for auction in the earliest is seven years from now if they opt out and it could be 11 years from now so no nfl deal and you're going to revolutionize sports i don't think so personally yeah i agree with everything you said except for the nfl which is like the NFL wouldn't let Apple revolutionize sports. They they no, wouldn't. Who's let... going to do that though? MLS. I got it, but like I, as much as I like soccer, and MLS got messy. It's still MLS. Even in the story, he said something to the fact that they thought it might be too small, and then they mm. did it. I have respect for MLS. That said, it's not baseball. It's not college football. It's not the NFL. It's not the NBA. It's not college hoops. It's not any package that traditional linear TV actually- uh, They outbid them by like hundreds more. of millions of dollars. So it's yeah. like, they didn't want it, these other, I mean, and then you take out the, whatever, and they take out the production costs. So whatever, it's just, there was no choice there. Now, is it different? Yes, and revolutionary, possibly. You know whose thoughts I'd like about Apple in the future? Rob Manfred. <laughs> Let's get to it. All right, John, joining us now is Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball. Rob, welcome to the Martian and Orient Sports Media Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Glad to be with you guys. Rob, you have uh, something in common with Andrew Martian. You both went to school in Ithaca. Yeah. Can I tell you something? Um, it, 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 this is a good day to be talking about Ithaca. It's gray outside, right? Andrew, you'll remember that's the case, right? Well, um, you know, the thing is, the reason John, this comes up sometimes, you know, sometimes people ask you where you went to school. And I say Ithaca. And then they say Cornell. And then I always say, well, if I was smart enough to go go to Cornell, I would have said I went to Cornell, <laughs> not Ithaca I, College. But I Ithaca does have a lot of sports media people in it, including Bob Iger, um, who's the obviously CEO of Disney. Um, and you know, the great Carl, school, Ithaca yeah, Carl College. Ravage, Carl Ravage, something like baseball. So, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of media people. All right, let's start off. Let's just talk about the media uh, to start off. Just when you look at the state of the media uh, from your perspective as the commissioner, what do you see right now? Uh, look, I see um, an ecosystem that is in a period of really rapid change. Um, you know, I think it's particularly um, focused at the local level, uh, but I also see it as um, a, a landscape that presents opportunity um, if, you know, you guess right and, and manage the change appropriately. So when you talk about opportunity, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, let me pick a concrete example for you. I think that um, while obviously taking over um, the 
broadcast situations in San Diego and Arizona was not ideal from some uh, perspectives. I do think it, it's provided us with an opportunity to provide a digital product in market and improve the reach of both of those clubs significantly. Rob, we, we have you uh, on the pod just be before you're going into the playoffs, but I, I have a question about sort of next opening opening day uh, coming mm -hmm. in, in the spring. Uh, we already know that there's not going to be a Warner Brothers Discovery Sports that, that, that has a, a regional sports networks. There's right. a very good chance that uh, that uh, Diamond Sports Group will not be able to come out of uh, bankruptcy by then. What's baseball's plan? Um, you know, our plan is to continue on the path um, uh, that we're on, John. Um, we're going to be there and prepared uh, to make sure that just like the fans in San Diego and Arizona, uh, the games will be available within the traditional linear model um, and that they will have a broader digital opportunity to watch their games. Um, and, you know, if it's um, eight teams, 12 teams, 16 teams, it doesn't matter. We're going to be prepared to go. In terms of uh, fans at a local level, if we spin this forward, what's the most likely way that they're going to be watching these, these games? I think you're going to see um, for a period of time, at least um, what I refer to as a hybrid model. I think that, um, you know, there are people, including people like me, frankly, that um, are prepared to pay for the traditional cable bundle, are comfortable with it, appreciate the value that that bundle provides. Um, and we're going to continue to offer games within that bundle. But I think um, there's clearly going to be a broader opportunity for people who are outside the bundle to get at particularly local broadcasts uh, that will almost certainly be in a direct to consumer um, model, meaning that, you know, you can go to MLB.tv and buy a local market package in addition to the outer market package. But it may also be with another or other digital platforms that make the content available as well. I mean, I think our goal overall is to get as close as we can to allowing our fans to watch on whatever platforms they want to watch on. Do you believe that baseball or the teams need to partner with a, a digital company or a media company in order to, to provide that? I know we don't have to, um, but I think with the right partner, um, there are advantages um, in, in terms of scale, um, the uh, frequency with which fans, maybe more casual fans are visiting a particular platform may make it more likely that we actually capture that fan. So there, there are advantages. Um, we certainly can proceed with the model that we have right now in San Diego and Arizona um, and do it direct to consumer. But um, I think there are partnerships out there that could be good for the game. Now, I think you're subsidizing those two teams with 80% of what they would have gotten if they had uh, still had their cable agreements. That's correct? Yeah, we agreed to subsidize the teams. So yeah. what is it going to do, though, long term or even in the not even long term, midterm uh, in terms of revenues for these small? These are mostly smaller markets as compared to, you know, the Yankees and the Mets and all those other, you know, we always have had. But it seems like that might make it even more drastic. How do you deal with that issue? I think the most important point to make at the outset is that given the agreements we were able to strike with distributors um, and uh, the sales that we were able to make um, in the digital space, the actual subsidy to those clubs was really pretty small. Um, I think going forward, um, you know, we are confident that we can produce revenue streams in those local markets um, that are not drastically um, different from what the teams have come been used to enjoying there may be a little downtick and then a build back up um, we really do believe in the fundamental value of the content and we think you know over time in this new model we will be able to more than replicate the revenue streams that clubs have enjoyed so in terms of you said pretty small so from 80 percent, what kind of percent are we talking yeah i mean i think that 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 um we believe that in general, you know, and not every deal is the same, some older, some newer, whatever, we will be around that 80% figure for most clubs. 
you pay attention to everything that's gone on in terms of all these different media deals and you guys are on the cutting edge of all of it. The idea of an MLS model um, in terms of selling all the games uh, direct to consumer, or at least what are now local games direct to consumer. Is that realistic? Cause you know, teams like the Yankees, the Mets have big deals um, with their networks, their local regional networks, and they don't seem as, in tune with possibly doing that because they're making a lot of money locally. Where, where do you see that going? I think that um, it is, would be a mistake for a sport like ours. And I'm not talking about MLS or any other sport. I think it's a mistake for a sport like ours to um, abandon the traditional um, cable bundle. There are, you know, even if it's 40 million homes, there's economics there that are really important to the industry. And I do believe there are going to be people who persist in that model for, you know, a, a period of time that's long enough to, to make it worthwhile to hang in there and, and reap those economics. Um, I, I, I think that um, to abandon that piece of the landscape is a mistake. I think that the better approach um, is to try to expand the places uh, that the content is available. And I think the nice thing about some of the newer digital platforms, they're not all that concerned about um, allowing us or uh, to continue, at least us. I mean, I can't talk about anybody else to continue in the traditional bundle side by side. Um, I do think that the, the, the big loser um, as we kind of go through this media transition is going to be the concept of exclusivity. Uh, I have another question about the the local rights and specifically about Sinclair and, and Diamond Sports. And uh, you uh, and, and baseball have been unique among uh, basketball and, and hockey and just and being out in front of, of this and being very public about, uh, about uh, and driving a harder bargain about pulling your rights back. Why is that? All I can say is, all I can talk about is our position. Our position um, has been founded on a fundamental belief that um, our content has inherent value um, and that the difficulties encountered by Sinclair um, has less to do with the value of our content than with business decisions that they consciously made, including purchasing the assets and then putting what I think everyone agrees and time has shown to be an excessive amount of debt um, on uh, on that enterprise. Um, so, you know, um, maybe it, it's tough bargaining, um, but um, I don't really think it's good business to devalue your product in order to cover up um, you know, some bad decisions that another entity made. You've mentioned, you've referenced the cable bundle several times. And boy, well, talk about a great business model, especially for, for sports leagues where you get grandma down the street that's uh, paying to uh, subsidize uh, my watching right. the, the Orioles. Moving toward direct to consumer is going to mean less less local revenue coming in. How long do you expect before that uh, catches up to where teams are now or were last year? I think the combination of um, revenues on the digital side, whether it be direct to consumer or with a digital partner and the revenues out of the um, remnant of the, the cable bundle, the smaller cable bundle, will be back to kind of 100 percent of where we are today in no more than two or three years. I really do believe that. Now, a constant question that we have, and I know you guys have been looking into how to solve this problem is is blackouts. Um, with MLB TV, for example, and then people who aren't really near stadiums but can't watch games, especially in the Midwest. Um, I, you guys are aware of this. I mean, people kind of have this sometimes, I think, uh, like this uh, vision of you guys like not caring. Um, you know, I, I personally know that's not the case, right? So what, but what, what are you doing? What can be done? And, and why hasn't it happened? Well, I, I think that um, it's important to distinguish between various situations that result in blackouts, okay? Um, let's start with the one that we're working very actively on. A lot of people started talking about being blacked out because 
for example, the Bally's RSN did not get distribution on their cable system. And they talk about that as a blackout, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a product of a concept that, that uh, I talked about a minute ago, exclusivity, and I do believe that, you know, one of the kind of fundamental um, goals that we have as the media landscape is reworked is that, you know, whatever exclusivity we give to a particular cable provider, um, we ought to have the ability to go side by side with a digital product so that people are not blacked out. That, and, and we're worth that is you know, business objective number one at Major League Baseball right now. Um, you know, the reason it has taken uh, a, a long time to get at, at this blackout issue is that, you know, when clubs make long term RSN agreements, um, they grant they historically have granted exclusivity that covers both sides of the house to that cable provider. Um, and if the cable provider uh, doesn't get distribution in a particular area, you have a blackout, right? And that's yep. beyond yep. our control. That's, you know, the product of a contractual arrangement between an individual a club and an RSN. And that's one that has been hard to deal with. Now, one that's close to home here is, you know, the Yankees, for example, to watch them, you need, yes, you need Apple, all the games, if you want to watch Apple, Amazon, uh, ESPN, you need all these providers. Now, I get why that is, but w it's not great for fans in terms of that. Look, we had the thing with Aaron Judge last year with the 60-second homer and it was on Apple uh, or po potentially was going to be on Apple. So what, what's your feeling on that? Look, I think fragmentation um, is not good for fans, and we understand that. It's something that we want to avoid. I would make a couple of points. Um you know, put Amazon to one side because that's a Yankee decision, right? As opposed to an MLB decision, the we have always we MLB has always have a right, had a right to a certain number of national games that were going to be taken off um, the RSN. The Apple group of games came out of that national package, um, so you know it really isn't a that big a change. OK, having said that, we would not have bought into that additional fragmentation. That is by adding Apple and Peacock, we're, if we did not feel that we were in a transitional mode where it was really important for us to begin to identify potential partners on the digital side that could help us adjust to the rapidly changing media landscape. Um, and so what I would say to fans about this is bear with us. This is a, you know, a step backwards along the road to getting you more access to more games more easily with less friction. Uh, Rob, we are now uh, in uh, year two of Apple TV's deal. What, what, what have you learned from that? You know, I think that um, the most important thing um let me say two things. First of all, Apple's passion for presenting baseball in a fresh way, um, I, I think, is refreshing. Um, they're, they're, they're more than willing to try different things. And I think in a sport that, you know, has a very um, traditional uh, broadcast history, that that's a really good thing. Um, and secondly, I, I think that um, the relationship with a Apple has reconfirmed our view of the fundamental value of the content and makes me optimistic about where we're headed in the future. Eddie Q was quoted in GQ talking, saying that he was trying to push you on the robot umpires. You recall that conversation? I do recall the conversation, maybe not exactly the same way Eddie recalls it, but <laughs> I love Eddie, you know, <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> That's the passion that you were talking about, Commissioner. Yeah, no, it is. It is. And, you know, Eddie came in and, and you know, spoke to our owners at an owner's meeting um, not long ago. And I think that passion kind of oozed um, out in, in his presentation. Are we getting robot umpires? I think that... Um, we will have, first of all, I, I, I really don't like the phrase robot umpires because it creates a, a, a misimpression. You know, every system we've tested maintains the role of the home plate umpire, right? Whether it's a challenge system or full ABS, 
there's an umpire behind home plate who's making the calls. Um, and I think that's important for some fans. It creates a misimpression. I do think um, the technology um, is, you know, down pat. We're good to one one hundredth of an inch in terms of accuracy. Um, having said that, one of the lessons we learned from the rule changes this year, you, you have to um, use them for a substantial period of time in the in the minor leagues to make sure you have not only the core, but all of the unintended consequences that you can think of nailed down before you bring, bring them to the big leagues. And I think, you know, there are a couple of things that we are working on with ABS that it's going to be another year or so before we're ready for the big leagues. Now, the national games that you moved over to Peacock and Apple, those were previously on ESPN. So it was like one service. And so right. the, the issue, I think, in t- tell there's me- fragmentation. I, yeah. I, I, and I didn't mean to suggest there wasn't. Okay. I, you're, you're 100 percent right about it. it. It takes instead of having, you know, X number of national games split up between Turner and ESPN, you now got them split up between Turner, ESPN, Peacock, and Apple. And there, you know, there's a separate economic transaction in there. And I appreciate all those. And we uh, we put that additional friction in the system because we felt it was necessary to begin relationships and experiment with these digital partners in order to put us in a position to move forward effectively. Right, let's look at some other experimentation that you've done is the microphones uh, on the players uh, with you know ESPN's, you know, they all done it, but it's been very prominent on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. First off, what have you thought about how that's worked out? I, I absolutely love it. I think it is um, a great way um, to enhance our broadcasts at moments where there's not action and enhance it by giving fans one of the things they want most, that is insight into who the player is and what he's thinking. And, and, and it's unique in the sense it's who he is and what he's thinking in the game. Um, you know, I, I just think it's a, I think it's a great development for the game from the fans perspective. And what do you want to see next? <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I think that um, what is going to happen next in terms of those sorts of enhancements um, is going to be something that is at least in the first instance discussed and, um, you know, some consensus reached in the competition committee. I've tried to be respectful of that committee. And so I, that one I, I would prefer to beg off on out of respect for the process, not because I don't want to talk about it, but I, I think out of respect for the process, that's a good place for me to be. Rob, uh, th- this year, of course, Lots of new rules. We saw the average length of the games come down. Uh, TV ratings, they weren't quite as high, uh, high as I was expecting to be, uh, g- given the level of interest that uh, at least we had down here in the, in, uh, the Washington, Baltimore area. Uh, take us through some of the rule changes and one year in sort of uh, your viewpoints or your thoughts about them. Yeah, uh, look, let me let me stop you on the ratings for just a second. I mean, um, I, what I would say about the ratings, you know, our national broadcast, the group of them were up about 2%. Um, You know, I think important for us, we were really improved in the 18 to 34 demographic. Um, Local, which is so important to us, we were up 7% local, even though there was a 9% subscriber decline. I mean, that's a phenomenal number. Um, And, you know, on the digital side, we were up 16% in terms of the number of games watched. So, you know, I, I do think that um, in this environment, um, ratings, you got to watch them, you know, but I think you need to try to take as broad a picture as you can in terms of how people are consuming because they're consuming in, in, in different ways. Um, in terms of the rules themselves, uh, it, you know, we could not be more pleased. I know people focus on the time of game and that's an important consideration. Um, I, I, to me, uh, the the combination of the rules, and it is a, a group that worked together, um, has produced less dead time, more action, and more athleticism in the game. Absolutely no question about it. Um, you, you know, um, I think you know uh, people stopping commissioners, certainly me, I shouldn't on the street to say something positive is not all that common on a lot of topics and has been 
by fans an unalivedly positive response to the rules. Um, and, and, you know, it, look, it, it's not rocket science. Everything we did from a rules perspective was based on fundamental research with our fans as to what they wanted to see. Um, we experimented until we thought we knew what was going to happen. And we think we delivered to them what they were looking for. Some of the networks, at least early on in the season, we're talking about for the playoffs, maybe making the pitching clock a little bit longer. Did you consider that? Yeah, we gave it to consideration. Um, I think two things um, really kind of carried the day. Uh, number one, you pay 2,430 games with one set of rules. We have always, I'm not saying we haven't done it because we have the extra inning rule, but um you know, the idea of using different rules in the playoffs was not appealing um, to a large segment of our own group. Um, the second thing, you know, for I don't know exactly where this landed, but as of two or three weeks ago, we were delivering the average pitch with nobody on base with six seconds left on the clock um, and with somebody on base with eight seconds left on the clock. Finally, we did go back and, you know, did some sort of anecdotal type research. We looked at big moments in the postseason. Uh, there's a great Tom Verducci has one on YouTube that he did. You know, you look at the Kirk Gibson at, at bat in, in the World Series. There's no pitch clock violation in that at bat. So, you know, I think the combination of those three things led us to conclude that um, we should play the way we played all year. When you look at sports gambling, um, first off, what's your impression? Like, do you think, you know, we, everyone's kind of jumped into it, all the sports, right? You're not alone. Um, but what's your impression of like how that's worked out um, first off? Well, I, look, I think that um, from day one, um, we had two thoughts with respect to sports betting. Um, number one, we thought the principal benefit of sports betting for us was going to be fan engagement, deeper, more consistent fan engagement. So we were never, we were not looking for some massive revenue hit all at once. Now we, there are revenue opportunities that have been nice revenue opportunities for us, the data business sponsorship. Certainly we have taken advantage of those. Um, but you, you know, we, we thought of it um, from the perspective of engagement. Secondly, um, we are a family product. We believe firmly that we are a family product. And so um, I actually sent some of my best young guys, men and women, to um, Europe a few years ago to talk to sports leagues that were involved in sports betting. And, you know, we, we have tried to be cautious about the con their concept of over gamblification, too much gambling, too many places in the sport. And um, we think we've struck um, a balance there where we are getting the, some of the engagement boost without um, creating the potential for alienating that family audience. Do you think, though, I know when DAZN had the inside pitch or whatever that the, the highlight show, I think one of their ideas was to have sports gambling within the show. Um, you know, within, within the game so you could gamble right off your screen. Do you see that uh, coming? I see that at some point coming as a alternate digital product, right? I mean, you're always going to have that clean broadcast. If we get there to the betting off the screen, it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, like a separate digital feed that the true gambler can opt into. Rob, I, personally, I'm thrilled to report that the Yankees and the Red Sox and the Mets are all out of the playoffs. <laughs> I think it's going to be great. So congratulations for that. Uh, but in terms of losing these big markets and these big brands, I know all the teams are sort of like your sons there. Right. How, how much do you look at the big markets and, and, and sort of want to see those go through for obvious reasons dealing with media? You know, look, I, I think that um, it, it is <laughs> – I know people are dismissive of the concept of uh, neutrality, uh, you know, in terms of the league thinking about who wins. I actually believe pretty deeply in, in that. I mean, we should be happy 
that the Baltimore Orioles are going to be in them. Uh, you know, I am pandering now, right? Um, <laughs> at least I admit it when I pander, right? Best interview be- we've ever had, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, um, but, you know, we have to be happy about that. I mean, we sell competition at the end of the day. I am, believe me, I'm not so naive as to uh, that I don't recognize that, you know, big markets help drive our business. But I also and, you know, we saw it a little bit last year, you know, Philadelphia hadn't been in in a while. It's you know, it's a big market. It's not L.A. and New York, but Philadelphia drove our business last year. And you know what? I think if Baltimore goes deep, they're going to drive our business. John's going to drive your business. (laughs) (laughs) Ratings in my house are through the roof. Uh, Actually, I do have a quick uh, one final uh, question about the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, The level of angst in Baltimore right now over that there still isn't a stadium deal. Uh, there, there's a, a angst that Nashville is going to come and, and take the team. What, what are the odds that the Orioles are going to mo- leave Baltimore? I, I think it, that there is virtually no chance um, that the Orioles are going to leave Baltimore. I think that um, Camden Yards is a historically significant gem. I think that um you know, I believe that John Angelos and the governor are going to make a deal um, to make sure that it stays a gem for years to come. Um, and, you know, Baltimore is a historic franchise. And we look, I, I know we have a relocation out there right now. I believe me, I'm painfully aware of that fact. We have a really strong track record of franchise stability and i intend to keep that track record as intact as possible and how about the a situation how does that play out um you know look i i think that um you know uh we have to let the process play out um we're hoping that um we're in a position to take an owner vote on the relocation application in november um you know, I have made no secret about the fact that I, I, I think John Fisher and uh, made the decision that was best for the franchise, given all the circumstances. Um, he, you know, he spent a, you know, ev- a long time. I mean, certainly since 2014, when I asked him to do everything to f- he could to find a deal in Oakland. Um, at some point, you have to accept it's not going to work. Well, Commissioner Rob Manfred, I, we really appreciate your time. We wish you a great October. Um, I mean, I guess we it would be good if the Orioles do well so John can be happy, but also <laughs> the angst the he might. All the week. <laughs> I, you know, he's going to have to stay up late. You don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, it would be better for the post if the Yankees and Mets were in it, but um, I'll stay up for some of the games, maybe not every one of them. So it could be a, it could be it could be fun, though. Well, I encourage you to stay up for as many as you possibly can. I will. It's just a war of every night. Yeah. But now, I hear you. you know what? The pitch clock is one of the great things you've ever done. Though. I, 20 <laughs> years too late when I was covering baseball, I probably get about half a year of my life back, but still <laughs> tremendous. Wait, can, well, can thank I actually, you. I since you mentioned the that. pitch clock, can I, can I lob one quick question in on sure. the, the, the runner on second? Is that sticking around forever? The extra yeah, I think yeah, I think it's look really popular with the players, and I, I think the more we have used the extra inning rule, um, the more we've realized that it is actually important from a player health and safety perspective. You know, asking guys to stay out there eighteen innings and play positions they're not used to playing probably not a good plan for us. And that John, by the way, that's another win for for Manford, and the because the other thing about those games, everyone's like, oh, you know, the Rick Camp game back in '84, you know, when uh, you know, those are great to watch on highlight. There were like 12 people in the stands. Everyone right. left in these, old, old, you know, and, and and obviously the player safety. So another, that one's another win. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Listen, I enjoyed it, guys. It was good to be with you. Thank you for thank uh, you. for joining us. All right. Thanks. John, what were your impressions of that interview? You know, lots of newsy nuggets in there, a- Andrew. Uh, but the one that really resonated the most with me is when we were asking about Apple and Peacock and Turner and Fox and ESPN on and on and on. And he admitted, yeah, there's fragmentation, but he he said the fragmentation is a result of just the media business being in upheaval right now. And he was like, I literally was talking to the fans and just saying like, just allow us this moment to sort of try to figure things out. And we're going to go forward to where you know, we're going to give up exclusivity. So it's not going to be exclusive to an RSN. It's going to be on an RSN with a direct-to-consumer component alongside alongside of it. 
Yeah. And the reason I love the media is, you know, we talked earlier about Sean McManus and, you know, how his NFL deal in 1998 uh, was game changing for CBS. You look at Rob Manfred and the future of media. Uh, you know, the NFL is going to have a big say in the deal they just did, right? How they structured it with they had Amazon, they kept the cable bundle. There's some streaming, other streaming games besides Amazon. And then they kept everything else kind of the same as it was. Manfred's going to also going to be someone who's going to, you know, figure out where we're going in terms of media and specifically sports media in the future. Uh, and, you know, what he decides and what baseball decides uh, I mean, they're the most important for these RSN. Basketball is important as well. Hockey is important. But baseball is the most important in terms of the local digital landscape and the local cable landscape. Well, Andrew, that brings us to the end of another pod. Uh, please uh, go and uh, rate and review if you can. Uh, as always, we've got to give our thanks out to uh, the master of the board, Chris Mason, AC Wyatt, Krista Myers, who I believe got her first shout out on the pod today, our social media. Uh, well, media. I mean, she is the Marshan and Orand Taylor Swift beat reporter. <laughs> so she <laughs> can put that on her resume. Uh, and so uh, then the, yeah, the USA Today, the Nashvilleian, is that what it's called? The Nashville, the paper in Nashville. Um, they are Wait. hiring a Taylor Swift reporter, but maybe Krista Myers could do that if she doesn't like the social media stuff. Do you think they, they'll hire a Bruce Springsteen reporter? I'll apply for that. Maybe we were born to run. Bruce, I don't know. I feel like it's a Taylor Swift world right now. Uh, you need to calm down. Thank you for listening. Rate and review. We'll see you next week. You muted yourself. You've never sounded better. Wow. How did that happen? You muted yourself. I got to be that. The podcast improved. <laughs> just, just doing that for the bloopers. Uh, thank you. you thank you very much. Krista Murphy. Murphy. Soon to get married. Who, who was on? Wait, is it Krista Murphy or Krista Myers? Krista Myers. Sorry, Krista. Okay. <laughs>